going up and energy is released as you're going down. Okay, we call those latent energies, either required or released, latent heats. So one of the things um, I talked about the other day, where it's forming out there, is if we, on a nice cold, I'm going to this Oh, I don't know, I can kind of see, can I see the condensation? Yeah. You see the condensation? Kind of like, like a fog, like you can through it. Yeah, so the fact that we have condensation here on something that's cold means that it's basically kind of like the video we showed, the water molecules have slowed down enough, they're joining hands, and we have a certain amount of uh, intermolecular bonds, so water that was in the air now is liquefied. Okay? Are we on this part? I thought we were on the one before that. Did we do this one? Oh, okay. yeah, yeah, you're right. Thank we you. We have this one Water cycle. Thank you. Very good. Yeah, we did this one. Good call. And we did this one, right? Okay. Thank you. Um, so hold that thought. So the water cycle, otherwise called the hydrological cycle. Fancy name for it. You're already familiar with it. The word is latent heat in that first bullet. Okay. Um, I'm going to play this little video, but um, sometimes I dream of the hydrological cycle. We can do it too. You have too much hydrological cycle going on. Of course, the evaporation we're fine with. Um, anytime we see, you see a cloud, I'm going to try to kind of convince you of this. For the cloud, I'll put an L. We have L, liquid particles. Hey, Beth. Or we have solid particles. Of course, liquid be, would be kind of like rain droplets suspended up there, and solid would be ice crystals or snow. It's any, anytime you can see a cloud, it's not vapor anymore. It's not vapor anymore. It's one of these two. Um, and, and you might be like, well, why doesn't it just stay up there? Or why does it stay up there? You know, we have sea clouds all the time that don't draw precipitation. And it has to do with kind of like, a, I think of it as like a gentle updraft. We've got a gentle updraft going from the ground up all the time. Now, if the particles get too heavy in the cloud, and gravity kicks in, and basically they overcome that general uh, So yeah, so here we have um, evaporation. Um, by the way, do we have? Does Earth have a lot of oceans? Um, Seventy seventy five percent are by the water. So we have evaporation, um, condensation in the clouds, and then of course precipitation dropping. Okay, so those are the main sort of things. The hydrological cycle. Um, Let's see, like the hydrological cycle. So do you guys have this slide too? Wait, do you have this slide, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So how do we get condensation? So this is condensation that goes from a vapor to a liquid. Well, you need to have those hydrogen bonds form. And how do you get those hydrogen bonds to form? Um, there are uh, two kind of reasons why you can get those hydrogen bonds to form. One is temperature, and one is actually, how many water particles do you have there that might want to shake hands and go ahead and liquefy to condense? Um, humidity in general is by uh, what we talk about, how much water vapor there is in the air. The term humidity. And some people's hair does funky things when it's humid outside. There's all sorts of interesting natural things that happen in high humidity. Uh, doors swell, okay, that sort of thing. Um, so if you have a high humid, humid conditions, then it's likely you can go ahead and have enough volume of gas particles to go ahead and join hands and to liquefy. The other one is temperature, so those two things. Okay, um, so humidity makes them kind of close together so they can connect. High humidity does. The other thing is about temperature. Temperature kind of cools them down. Uh, when we cool something down, we kind of slow it down. I'm going to kind of make this, this is showing me how fast it's going. Kind of slow it down and it can go ahead and condense too. So those are the two things. So if you're wanting to get water to condense, those are your options. Oops, do we have, sorry, the word is slow. So to get this, we call this condensation. 
and you can either have lots of humidity or and or uh, cooler temperatures. So that's kind of like, uh, you know, I tried to get water to condense on the outside of this cold speaker, uh, but honestly the best time to do that is like in summertime when it's really humid outside and you have a cold beverage. High humidity, but it's like, oh, I got all sorts of water vapors that are ready to join hands. Okay, and I'm cooling it down. So that's kind of how we get condensation to happen. Um, where? Kind of set another way. What does what favors condensation? Um, high water vapor and cool or low temperatures. All right. So here's a thought for you. I have three pictures to kind of show you. And each picture, think of you give it a little bit of time. So we have this nice sealed box. It's at 20 degrees Celsius. And uh, in the box, I've got um, air, but it's dry air, no water vapor. This little gauge up here is going to detect the water vapor. Gauges are great. Gauges are great. They actually um, are measuring this bumping around that we have gas particles doing. That's what that pressure gauge is. All right, now, picture I had saran wrap. I'm gonna remove the saran wrap over the water. Okay, we're just sealed, sorry. Words evaporate and condense. All right, so now I have removed the saran wrap, and just a natural thing for these liquid water particles to do is they're going to start to go ahead, and some of them, some of the liquid ones, are going to go ahead and have enough little kinetic energy of themselves to break their bonds with their buddies and become a gas. It's just what it will do. It will do that. And it will do that for a while. Notice that we have this, and the numbers are important here. We have three evaporations and we have one condensation. So notice what happened to the pressure gauge. It went up. So we give it a little more time, and this now we have moist air, it's not dry air. We give it a little bit more time. Word is equilibrium for that third bullet. Now let's look at that third one. Okay, so what's different? How many particles do we have evaporating? How many? How many do we have evaporating? Somebody say five? Yes. Yeah. How many do we have condensing? Five. So there's a lot of things in, um, I say science, just, just nature things, where uh, it establishes an, what we call equal equilibrium. This is one of those things. So we have equal evaporation, equal condensation. Um, you probably in weather heard this idea of uh, the air is 100% relative humidity. This would be 100% relative humidity. Why? Because the rate of evaporation, the amount of evaporation is equal to the amount of condensation. It's what we call, sometimes we use the word saturated. The air is saturated. Now notice it's important in these three diagrams to say what the temperature is. Because I'm going to tell you uh, how many, so I'm going to go, I'm going to ask you a question. You're going to have your hand. Dry air or, or drip, sorry, cold air or warm air, which holds more water vapor? How many people think cold air holds more water vapor? I would think people people think warm air holds more water vapor. Huh. It is it is warm air holds a little more water vapor, and and we can kind of think about it. If it's cold air, if it's cold, what are you going to get? You're going to get more condensation. So it's gonna it's going to be dry. Cold air is drier. So let's kind of build on that. Oh, the word is <laughs> goodness. The word is saturated. The air is saturated at that last one. And this is the one, again, if we kind of look at the cheesy little um, uh, pressure gauge on the top, notice the pressure gauge has the most deflection. And again, when you think about a gas pressure gauge, think it's, I just think, I just think making devices are cool. It's actually measuring the little bumps of these gas particles against that gauge. I'm easily entertained.
Well, let's watch this video about humidity. I think I kind of remember this one. He does a good job. Oh, the word is atmosphere, though. We have water here on the sides of the container. You, I think that air in there is probably saturated, 100% relative humidity. So we have um, evaporation, uh, using the heat from the hot plate to break bonds. It's going to vapor phase. And of course, it's cooler up here than it is at the hot plate. So that's why we have condensation up here. This is called a wash glass. Up here is a wash glass. Okay. So I'm thinking equilibrium, saturated, 100% relative humidity. Um, all right. The word is several, several ways. Uh, that dude talked about absolute humidity, mixing ratio, or he, I don't know if talking about mixing ratio, I know he talked about absolute humidity and relative humidity. Um, think of absolute humidity as this, that you have, I, mean, I can't remember, tomorrow's lab, I can't remember which units we're going to be using. I know we're going to build up to relative humidity. Absolute humidity is you have a way to go ahead and get to the grams of water. Like, for instance, in this room, like how many grams of water are in this room? Okay? And there are ways to do that. Um, so, relative humidity, oh, sorry, mixing right here. So, absolute humidity, here's, here's an example. No? <laughs> Uh, so here we go. Here we have a chunk of air, and we have those cute little Mickey Mouse things. Those uh, two white things are the hydrogen atoms, and the red thing is the oxygen atom. You can see that they have a lot of motion. So this is what it's trying to show you: vapor particles. Okay. Um, so in this case, they went ahead, and we happen to have a volume of one cubic meter. Um, the mass uh, of dry air is one kilogram. They went in, in that volume of one cubic meter, they went ahead and came up with uh, 20 grams of water vapor. So to get the absolute humidity, all they did was take this number, 20 grams, divide it by volume, 20 grams per cubic meter, that's it. Now mixing ratio, oh sorry. So here's the deal. Uh, one of the things, what, how would you describe this chunk of air versus the other chunk of air? What's happening? To the volume. It's getting bigger, yeah. And and one thing I'm going to try to convince you of is that actually, and I would call this a vertical, like we're going up vertically. One of the things that air air does is is it if it goes up vertically, which air does, it gets expands. Uh, weather balloons, oh wow. So weather balloons, they fill them with. He can feel them. And basically, they start out, and I've seen videos like this, they start out about the size of, oh, about as much as you can put your hands out. Now, as that helium-filled balloon goes up, it actually, the volume gets larger and larger and larger and larger. So basically, up at a certain elevation, oh, by the way, um, so the way uh, weather balloons work is they are carrying a little basket, a little gizmo, and the little gizmo, uh, um, has a little parachute. That's cool. Because at a certain elevation, that um, the volume of that weather balloon is going to be about the size of the house. <laughs> oh, wow. So of course the latex can't support that volume. So the latex breaks, and then this little gizmo thing has its own little cute little parachute. Which I want to find one of those one day. Full the weather balloon things. But my point is, if it rises, it expands. So let's see what, what consequence that does to relative humidity, because we have grams, which are still 20 grams, but now we have a new volume. Now instead of one meter, we have two cubic meters. One cubic meter went to two cubic meters, doubled. So of course, that means that our, um, our, absolute humi yeah, our absolute humidity, now we take 20 grams divided by two, and we get 10 grams per cubic meter. Okay. Well, let's see what mixing ratio does. Mixing ratio then, when we look at these two kind of elevations, these two parcels of air, it's going to stay the same. Because all we're doing with mixing ratio is we're taking that 20 grams in both cases, we're going to divide by the mass of the dry air. The mass of the dry air did not change when it, when it expanded. Okay? 
So that means the mixing ratio down here is 20 grams of water vapor per kilogram of dry air, 20 grams of water vapor per kilogram of dry air. So one of the things we have with absolute humidity is as the volume changes, it changes. Um, yeah, we kind of, I kind of threw this at you. Warm air will hold more water vapor than cold air. One way to think of this, and I get, I used to get these more mixed up than I do now, but in my house, we are humidifying our house right now in the wintertime. In the summertime, we dehumidify it. Okay. And the reason is, um, you figure your house, it shouldn't be 100% sealed up. It shouldn't to be a healthy house. It needs to breathe a little bit. Well, it breathes when you open the door and all that. But there is an exchange to a certain extent between the outside air and the inside air. So that outside air is very dry when, and the colder it is, the drier it is. When I kind of talk more, I have a, I have a graph here to show you how dry cold air can be. Okay, so it finds its way into our house. It's dry, we get dry. So we can get a bite. It saves our musical instruments and makes us healthier. Um, so the word is relative, relative humidity called RH. I need to say what um, AC is actual water content and MC is maximum water content. And sometimes when I get to this topic, I, I kind of sh I kind of do it this way. The the actual you have to measure it, like you have to have some sort of measuring device, and the maximum content you look up on a table. You look it up on a table. So here's a table that we could look up. Um, if I knew, well, yeah, I do know. So water boils at uh, um, so this a little. Yeah, 100 degrees Celsius, so I'd have to go down here. But let's just say I cooled this down to um, 35, that's still pretty hot, 95 Fahrenheit, 35 Celsius. If I cool this down, then and, and I went ahead and kept it covered, it would still hopefully be in equilibrium. And I know that I would have, see what the units are. Um, I would have 35 grams of water vapor in one kilogram of dry air if it's saturated. Let's see the trend. We said that as the air gets colder, it holds less water vapor. So let's go to 32 degrees Fahrenheit, zero Celsius. Notice instead of 35, it can only hold 3.5 grams of water vapor per one kilogram of dry air. So that's kind of the holding. Now, I, I put the word holds in quotes because um, it's not really holding the water vapor, but okay. so these would be the MC values. These would be the maximum values we use for our how close are you to 100% relative humidity? Okay. So, so uh, that's definitely temperature dependent. The word is condensation at 100% relative humidity. Condensation will generally occur. Um, so if we're hoping to reach 100% relative humidity, we can either go ahead and increase the AC. Now remember the AC is the actual water content. So we can go ahead and, and pump our, our air with, with more water vapor, or we can go ahead and um, lower the, multiple, the, the maximum water content by lowering the temperature. So actually, have we kind of just kind of come back to this? If I want to go from vapor to a liquid, what do I do? I increase the humidity and or I lower the temperature. So, yep, yep. So I've got some examples here. Um, so kind of again from left to right, kind of think of time, thinking of it to kind of go ahead and get, reach an equil, to a quill, right? Not 20 degrees, but we have 25 degrees. So if I go back here, 25, all right, here's 25, guys. So look, we're looking at 25 degrees Celsius. We've got this situation to reach 100% relative humidity. That's 20, 20 grams of water vapor per kilogram dry air. So here we go. So I'm starting out 25, 
degrees Celsius, and instead of 20 grams, I have five grams, okay? So I can see what my, um, you guys have these to fill in here? Okay, you guys can already see. So uh, from the table, I got this one, the 20, that's from the table. Uh, the water vapor content here is five grams. To get the relative humidity, all I gotta do is take the five, which is actual, divided by the 20, which is maximum. That's it, it's five divided by 20. And that's uh, one fourth, or 25%. So let's look at the next one. We give a little bit of time. We got some evaporation going on. Still not saturated, right? Because I'm not at 20, I'm on sub 10. So notice that my maximum water stayed the same, 20, the same, same across here. Now I've got 10 instead of five. To get my relative humidity, I take the 10, which there was, divided by actual, divided by 20, that's the maximum. So you're gonna look at a 50%. And then last but not least, you can see I hit that magical point. I should see it kind of sweating along the sides here, maybe, where I'm at the 20 grams, so I, my actual is equal to my maximum. So you're like 100% relative humidity. Cool. This one's a little bit different. Uh, we're not going to hold the temperature. We're going to cool it down. We're going to start at 20, again, one kilogram of dry air. If we look at the table a few slides ago, you could look at 23 Celsius and you would recognize that one kilogram of dry air can hold 14 grams of water vapor. Well, seven out of 14, you're at 50% relative humidity. I go ahead and cool it down, where now I have a different maximum. The cold air can hold less water vapor, only seven instead of 14. I'm at seven, so seven divided by seven, you're at, you're at saturated, you're at 100% relative humidity. So does this make sense then? If I go ahead and cool it down even further, I gotta have a funnel. Why? Because at this lower temperature, I look it up and it can only hold 3.5, and I had seven. So like this graph says, or this figure shows, I must have dumped 3.5 in the bottom of that flask, okay? So notice I went ahead and still have 3.5, you're at 100% relative humidity. Ah, the old feels like temperature. Let's see, um, I'm gonna, I didn't preview these this semester, but let's see what we got with some videos. And to mist yourself actually, or to get wet or whatever, you're actually giving yourself a layer of liquid to evaporate to cool you off. But if the humidity's high, that's down to evaporation. Um, okay. Uh, what about, let's do the other feels like temperature. I guess that's coming up when we talk about wind. So hold that thought for wind chill. Um, cool saturation. So a little bit ago, I kind of showed that, we showed that one cubic meter parcel of air, and I know it was flat, but it's like a circular thing, a cubic meter, and two cubic meters, and that's actually what chunks of air do as they rise. Think of the weather balloon. And uh, it's related to, maybe, uh, hold on. it expands. As it expands, it cools. As anything expands, it cools. Um, it just does. And with cooling, we can get condensation. That was our, one of our two ways to get condensation. Okay? So all you got to do is get a chunk of air to go up. The chunk of air will expand as long as you buy it. Well, I, I was trying to think of a common thing of expanding air cooling. Does this work? Yeah. So, um, who has not? Well, I, I, this is a rhetorical question. I can't this, but who has not like played with like the um, the dust off things? You know, like if you get your keyboard, you want a little bit of, and all dust off is compressed air. So you go ahead and you squeeze it, and it gets cold. I don't know if you've ever done that. Okay, good. So what's happening? The reason it gets cold is you have air that is expanding. Okay, it gets cold. It just does. Uh, Actually, it's doing work, expansion is work, and it needs to be, what we say, funded by something. And it's, and it's actually funded at the expense of the temperature of the gas. So how do you get your chunk of air to rise? Well, one is you can slam it up against a mountain. So you can kind of see this down here. We have a chunk of air, and this would be a, actually, I don't have my globe in here, but I don't know if you recognize this. This is the United States. This is our West Coast. 
This would be our uh, Sierra Nevada mountain range. So you get Chunkabera to slam up against there. And by the way, one of the things you might already know coming to this class is I have a map of the United States. We generally kind of have this westward, generally, uh, uh, air kind of coming from the west going to the east. So slam it, it goes up. We call that orographic lifting. So chunk of air rises, expands, cools, and you see condensation. That's the clouds. Well, how else can you get? That's called aura, orographic lifting. Kind of weird word. Here's another one for you. We'll be talking more about this. Uh, we can have what we call uh, down here. I don't know if you guys can see it very good. Maybe I'll just kind of blow it up. We have, uh, whoops, sorry. Maybe. Go back. This one. Oh, well, anyway. Well, I'm trying to, I'm trying to make it vague as you hopefully see this red warm air and this blue cold air. Those are what we call air masses. We'll talk more about that. But where air, air masses meet, we call that boundary up front. And actually, that's one lifting mechanism. The old air is, the cold air is nice and stubborn cold, and the warm air is kind of a little bit, a little more fun, a little bouncy, and so it'll go up and over. Um, that's called frontal lifting. And then here's one for you. This third one is by this third picture over here. So this could be on a potentially sunny day. And this could be, um, if you've ever flown in an airplane, you've kind of seen the, the kind of crops with their nice, cool, straight rows. All this is trying to show you is we have a, a spot on the earth that's a little bit darker. What happens if you wear a dark shirt out in the summer, time in the sun? You get hotter. You get hotter, yeah. And that's all this is trying to show you. Kind of a darker region. You get hotter. This chunk of air is getting hotter. And if you've ever used the old adage, warm air, or warm air, not higher, but warm air rises, that's all it's doing. This is actually what we call convective lifting, convective lifting, warm air is rising. Um, so those are three ways to get a chunk of air rising. Um, here's another one. It's called convergence lifting. What do you think air would do? Well, um, I'm just going to do this. What if I had like sandpaper here, nice little table here, and I go ahead and throw my pen? What's it gonna do when it hits the sandpaper? Go stop or slow down, and if, if that's gonna give it friction. And that's kind of what we have here with uh, Florida, who gets dumped on all the time. We have kind of nice, slick, smooth surfaces on the oceans, both sides of the peninsula. We have um, potentially air coming in and hits the, uh, I have to have the word bunches up, but it hits the land and it kind of bunches up, just kind of like it slows down, friction sort of thing. We call that convergence. Um, the last, yeah. So um, I'll try to make sure I start in the right place on Friday. I'm going to start with this one. Um, I'll talk a little more about the lifting condensation level. We'll look at those two videos. And we'll should get through this part on uh, finish this part on Friday, maybe start the next part. Okay? But enjoy those clouds between now and then. And we'll be talking about how to identify clouds. I think that's fun.